Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? How was the exam? Was it everything you hoped it would be? There were no uh, math fairies. Math fairies? Yeah, there were in fact no math fairies. <clears throat> okay, so let's continue then. Today is the 19th. So last time we ended talking about even and odd functions. Okay, so then can someone remind me um, what's the geometric condition for an even function? Like if it's, like if you reflect it and the function is different from the original then it's even. Then it's not even. Not even? Yeah. If it's the same as the original then it's even. Oh. Right. So an even function is when a horizontal reflection is the, is the same as doing nothing. Okay, when, a, when the horizontal reflection is the same as the original. What's an odd function? Right, where a horizontal reflection is the same as a vertical reflection. Or, if you like, where doing a horizontal reflection and then a vertical reflection is the same as doing nothing at all. Okay, so let's have an example of doing them computationally for a moment. So, for example, f of x is, is um, how about x squared plus 8 divided by x cubed plus 5x. And my question to you is, please determine if this is even, odd, or neither. Okay, and I want you to do it computationally. So, what do you think? It is not even. Oh, okay. It, it, and, it, and it is not neither. <laughs> okay, so then, so, okay, since I said that by process of elimination, okay, apparently it's odd. But why is that? But there's the squares in the numerator, I mean. So the way that you check, remember that an even function, an even function must satisfy that f of negative x is what? Is f of x. That is to say, a horizontal reflection does nothing. Mm -hmm. Whereas an odd function must satisfy that f of negative x is negative f of x, which is to say that a horizontal reflection is the same as a vertical reflection. Okay, so then in either case, we, we want to figure out, does it satisfy this, does it satisfy that, or does it satisfy neither of these things? So do you observe that in, in order to address the question, we need to do this. We need to see what happens if we switch x's for negative x's. So f of negative x. So we're going to substitute negative x into every position where there's an x. So negative x, we'll square that, and then plus 8, and then <coughs> negative x, we'll cube that, and then plus 5 times negative x. Okay, now, in the numerator, in the numerator, um, the 8, you know, nothing happened to it. How about negative x squared? How can that be simplified? Yeah, the negative squares away. So that would be x squared and then plus 8. And I'll leave these down here for the moment negative x cubed plus 5 times negative x. So what occurred here in that step <coughs> is that <coughs> negative x, remember what that means among other things, that's negative 1 times x. Okay, so then negative x 
squared, well, that's negative 1 times x squared. And then exponentiation distributes over product, which is to say that this is negative 1 squared x squared. But what's negative 1 squared? 1. Just 1. So this is x squared, which is what I meant when I said that the negative squares away. So any question about moving to here? No. Okay. So here I have negative x cubed. Does it cube away? No. Why not? We've got something against cubes. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have something against cubes. So why does it, why does it not cube away? Because right, so what's the <laughs> distinction between squaring and cubing? Right. So, okay. Would would a would a negative? Uh, I don't. There's not a verb for it. If if the exponent was four, would the negative go away? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So four would work. Four makes the negative go away. Does five work? No. Why not? Because it's, it's odd. Okay. So negative x raised to an even exponent, the negative goes away. Negative x raised to an odd exponent, the negative persists. So that is to say that this would be x squared plus 8. And then this would be negative x cubed plus 5 times negative x. OK. Then <coughs> x squared plus 8 and then negative x cubed, and I'll say minus 5x, like so. Okay, so any question getting to here? So now what I'd like for you to observe is in the denominator, I could factor out negative 1 in the denominator. So I'm going to do that. I did that. And now I'm going to factor the negative out of the, out of the denominator altogether and say that this is negative x squared plus 8 over x cubed plus 5x. But this thing that's in the big round parentheses right here, don't we have another name for it? What is that? It, it, it's f of x, isn't it? Mm. So what's the conclusion about our f? It's odd. It's odd. You have a question? Could, could you factor out the x from x cubed plus 5x? You could. But it, it's not necessary in, at any rate because, because what we wanted to establish is, is this true or is that true or is neither one of those true? Therefore, f is odd. <coughs> okay. Interesting. So any question about this computational example? Any question about it? Okay, so let's look at some pictures. Same prompt as before, except instead of giving you uh, formulas, I'm going to give you pictures. <coughs> so the question is, even odd or neither?
Okay, so just if it looks like I'm trying to do something, I'm trying to do it, okay? <laughs> so my hand's not perfect. So how about this one? Even, odd, or neither? So what's the geometric condition for even? So it would have to be the same. It means reflecting it is the same. So, so if we reflect it horizontally, is, it, is that the same thing? No. So this is, it's certainly not even. What's the geometric condition for odd? Flip it vertically. And it's the same as a horizontal. It's the same as flipping it horizontally. Okay. So let's flip it vertically. So what does this one look like when you flip it vertically? So let's draw it. So graphite is what I see when I flip it vertically. So like this. Now what would it look like if you flipped it horizontally? Same. So it's odd. So a horizontal flip is the same as a vertical flip. Okay, how about this one? Neither, neither right? So the reason why it's neither, it's not even because another way to think about even is to say that what would this one see if this was a mirror and it was looking in the mirror? Would it see that? No, <laughs> no it wouldn't see that. <laughs> yeah, unless it was a carnival mirror, right? Okay, so then <clears throat> it's not even. It's also not odd because if you were to flip this horizontally, then the jaggy part would be on the left. And if you were to flip it vertically, then the jaggy part would be down here. So that's not the same. So <coughs> how about this one? Neither. I before E? I don't know. No. <laughs> in, in, in this case... Yeah. <laughs> I, did, I just make it sufficiently ambiguous to where it could be either one, right? <laughs> so, how about this one? Even. This one's even because even though I didn't do it exactly right because my hand's not perfect, I, I intended so that it would be the same. Okay. So, even. How about the one on the bottom right? Functions can be both, even and odd. That's possible. It's not even. It's neither. Why is it neither? What is it? It's not a function. This is certainly not an even function, and it's certainly not an odd function, because it's not in the first place a function. Okay, good. Any question about this? <clears throat> so, um, even and odd. So what, there, there's exactly one function that is both even and odd. Is it linear? It is a, it is a straight line. Yeah, what is it? Hor a horizontal line at height zero. Because what if you take the horizontal line at height zero and reflect it vertically? It doesn't move. And what if you reflect it horizontally? Still the same. Well, <laughs> well I don't like that one. <laughs> well, okay. But it, it, it is both even and odd. And that's, it's, it's, a, it's a point of interest at any rate because there's, there are no numbers. There are no, there are no numbers that are both even and odd. But, but according to the definition of even and odd functions, there is a number of that is there is a function that is both. Okay. So now we've talked about reflections and things like that, and now we're in section 3.7, and we're going to talk about yet another reflection when we talk about inverse functions. So now, let's talk about inversion for a moment. So there's three operations that we're dealing with. We have addition, multiplication, and composition. 
addition, multiplication, and composition. And here we go. So addition. So by that I mean things like this, A plus B. So there is a, an identity. Identity of addition. So specifically, I want a number. I want a number so that adding this number to, to A is the same as, have, as having done nothing at all. Zero. The, the identity of plus is zero. Because A plus zero is A. Okay. So now, the inversion formula for plus is what? So that is to say that, well, what's the additive inverse of 5? Negative 5. What's the additive inverse of negative 8? Negative negative 8 which is 8, right? So then the inversion formula is negation. So for example, the additive, additive inverse of 5 is negative 5. Okay, now here's a question that many students at, at this position have difficulty having a clear answer about. I do agree, I do agree that the additive, additive inverse of 5 is negative 5. But why is that the case? That's right. And the reason why this is, is because 5 plus negative 5 is 0, and this is the, is the additive identity. That's the reason why. Okay, so I could ask, what is the what is the additive inverse of negative ten? Ten, and why is ten the additive inverse of negative ten? Ten plus negative ten equals zero. Zero is the the additive identity. Right, because that's how you get zero, which is the identity. Okay. <coughs> then we have multiplication. So that is to say A product B. Oh, yeah, and before I do before I do this, oops. So I'll say right here, what numbers have an additive inverse? Okay, so all non zero numbers. Does zero have an additive inverse? Actually zero is zero. It's its own inverse, right? Zero plus zero is zero. <coughs> so what number can you add to zero so that you get zero? Yeah. Zero. So all numbers have an additive inverse. Okay, now product. So what is the identity identity of product. So that is to say, what number is such that when you multiply any number by the identity, you get the same number? One. Because 
Multiplying by 1 is the same as doing nothing. That's why it's called the identity. Okay. <clears throat> so what is the inversion formula? product. So for the inversion formula for uh, sum for addition is negation. What's the, what's the inversion formula for product? So for example, what's the, what's the multiplicative inverse of 5? One fifth. What's the mul multiplicative inverse of 3 halves? Two thirds. Two -thirds. And how are you coming up with this? One over. And what's the name for one over? Starts with R. That's it. Reciprocal. So for example, the multiplicative <coughs> inverse, inverse has a V in it. of five sevenths is what? Seven fifths. And so let, let so is it negative seven fifths or is it seven fifths? And why? Just seven fifths. Just seven fifths. Okay. So I agree that this is correct, but I want to know the reason why it's correct. Why is it why is it that seven fifths is the multiplicative inverse of five sevenths? Because when you compute their product, 5 over 7 times 7 over 5, you get 1, which is the multiplicative identity. <clears throat> That's the reason why. Okay, so now. We, for addition, we said all numbers have a have a additive inverse. Do all numbers have a multiplicative inverse? No, not all of them have a multiplicative inverse. Zero, Zero doesn't have a multiplicative inverse. So what's the, what is the multiplicative inverse of negative two? Uh, two One over negative two, right? What's the multiplicative inverse of negative 10 over 3? Negative 3 over 10. What's the, what number can I multiply by 0 so that I'll get 1? There are not any. So now it's all non-zero numbers. have a multiplicative inverse. Okay. <clears throat> Terrific. So now what we're going to deal with is we were able to fit all this on a page and this more or less you already knew before you got here. Okay. Uh, but, but you probably weren't using this exact language all the time. Uh, we're going to do exactly this now except we're going to do it with the operation of composition. Okay, composition <coughs> of functions. Which is to say, we're going to have to figure out what is the identity of composition? What is the identity of composition? Supposing that there is a compositional inverse, how do you compute it? And how do you determine whether or not there is a compositional inverse in the first place? Right, because here we, have, we, we can see, oh, all numbers have an additive inverse. So you don't need to worry about that. This one, all non-zero numbers have a, have a multiplicative inverse. So if I said, find the multiplicative inverse of 5, does 5 have a multiplicative inverse? Yes, because 5 isn't 0. 
And so if I said, so, so it would be reasonable for you to go about trying to compute the multiplicative inverse of five. If I said compute the multiplicative inverse of zero, how should you respond? There is not one. That's how you respond. And you should not search for it. Okay. Similarly, I'm going to give you a function, eventually, I'm going to give you a function and say, I want you to compute its inverse. And implied in that instruction is that you should be able to detect, does this function have an inverse in the first place? And if it doesn't, you should say that it doesn't have an inverse for these reasons. And if it does have an inverse, then you say, okay, it does have an inverse, and here's what the inverse is. Okay? So any question about that? Now that we have the context of, we put, we put the rest of the lecture into context. Okay, so the first thing is pretty easy. What is the identity of composition? Identity. Okay, so then <clears throat> what is the additive identity? Zero. What is the multiplicative identity? One. One. The compositional identity. So composition identity. Is denoted with ID. So that's ID written in script. And its formula is ID of X is X. Okay, that is to say, looking at it as a drawing, it's a function that you give it X as its input, and it does nothing with that X. You give it an X, and it does nothing. Here's that X you gave me. It's like, uh, it's like, uh, a conveyor belt on the assembly line. It just pushes the X on down. Okay, the reason why this is, this is the identity is because I'd like for you to observe. F composed with identity evaluated at X. Well, what is the definition of this? That is to say, how can you write this without the composition operator? F of ID of X. Right, that's how you write it without composition. And then what's the formula for ID of X? Just X. So what this is saying is that composing F with ID is the same as having not done that at all. Composing f with id didn't do anything to f, to the result. So similarly, how about id of uh, id composed with f evaluated at x? Well, how do you write this without composition operator? Yes, it would be id of f of x. Well, what is ID of f of x? Well, no matter what I give to ID, ID gives it right back, right? So if I gave it a banana, ID of banana is banana. So what's ID of f of x? f of x. <coughs> so composing ID on the right or left doesn't change f at all. But of course you knew that, right? Because of the way this because of the way this works. Because if we were to do it like this, so x goes to the f machine and out comes f of x and then you give this to the id machine and then out comes what? f of x. id does nothing. This is like this is like make in an assembly line, this is like making the assembly line, the conveyor belt, a little longer, right? <laughs> Instead of it going on a conveyor belt for 10 feet, it goes on a conveyor belt for 15 feet. But it doesn't change the, the, the re result at all. Okay, similarly, 
x, we give it to the ID machine, what comes out? An x. And then we give it to the F machine, and out comes f of x. So what, I, what, what this is saying is that you could delete, you could delete this, and it would not, not change the result at all. Okay, so yes? You have to have an identity so you can know what it means to invert something. So it's the same, so your question, to say it a different way, is, well, if adding zero doesn't do anything, then what's the point of even having zero? So it's kind of the same, the same idea. You have, to, you have to know what the additive identity is so that, you can, so that you can be sure that, yes, in fact, negative 7 is the additive inverse of 7. Okay? So this is the compositional identity. So the additive identity is 0. The multiplicative identity is 1. The compositional identity is this function. And its name is ID. <laughs> for, for identity. <laughs> okay. So any question about the identity? Now it's a separate matter to ask just what functions, what functions have an inverse in the first place? functions are invertible. Okay. <clears throat> well, when we first talked about functions, we did arrow diagrams. So I'll do some of those. So here's a function. Okay, so then here's here's a function, and I'll call this function f. So so in the first place, is it actually a function? Yes. How can you tell that it is a function? What's the condition for a function? Each input, uh, or no, um, everything on the left side has to only have one line. One arrow leaving it, which is to say every input maps to one output. Okay, if there was two arrows leaving one, that wouldn't be okay, It'd be, it wouldn't be a function. Okay. So is this an invertible function? No, it's not invertible. Why is it not invertible? Right. So then this is, this is many to 1. So that is to say 1 and 2 both go to 9. Alternatively, if you were to turn these arrows around and point them the other way, would it be a function? No, because then there'd be two arrows leaving 9. It wouldn't be a function. So this is, this is a function, but it's uh, not one to one. One, two, one. And therefore, if we were to turn this around, if we were to turn it around, it wouldn't be a function. How about, how about this one? So is this a function? Yes. If we were to, if we were to uh, turn it around and turn the arrows the other way, would it also be a function? Yeah. It is. <coughs> so functions that have the property that you could turn them around and they're still a function, those are one to one.
So that's when we're talking about arrows. But when, when, I, when we draw plots of functions, how do you tell if a function is one-to-one? -one? A horizontal line test. So what functions are invertible? The answer to the question is one-to-one -one functions. are invertible. So you can think of it, thinking of a function like a machine, what it means is that you could sort of turn the machine around and run it backwards. So if you were standing on the right, <coughs> the right side of this machine, if you were standing right here, and you, could, you know the way the machine works inside, but you can't see the input side, only the outputs. If you observed an 8 come out, do you know what was put in? A three, only a three could produce an eight. So you could think of it like I could push that eight back in and then a three would pop out on the other side. Now supposing you're here on this machine, so calling this one G. If you're on the F machine and you watch a nine come out, are you sure about what was put in? No, it could have been a one or it could have been a two. So if you tried to push that nine back in, the machine wouldn't know what to produce. Okay. So one-to-one -one functions are invertible. So I could ask, So the prompt here is, please tell me which, which are invertible functions. So, top left, is it an invertible function? Yes. Yes, uh, because the question is equivalent to asking, is it a one-to-one -one function? And so, if I take this horizontal line, and you can imagine moving this horizontal line up and down, the number of intersections is always going to be one. That means that it passes the horizontal line test, so, so yes. This is invertible. So I haven't told you how to invert a function yet. But if I was to say, if I was to say, I want you to invert this, then you, then you would say, OK, it is in fact invertible, so I can proceed. OK, how about this one? Is it an invertible function? OK, why not? Right. So there's two intersections. One, two, so two intersections, and therefore it's not invertible. So if I was to say, if I was to give you the prompt, here's a function, compute its inverse, how should you respond? <coughs> it's not invertible. <coughs> okay, how about this one? Yes, yes it is invertible. There's sort of two little bits, two pieces. But I'd like for you to observe that if I move this horizontal line up and down, do you observe that in every circumstance there are always zero or one intersections? So then the answer to this one is that yes, it is invertible. Okay, how about the bottom right? It's not, a function. it's not a function. And therefore, it's certainly not an invertible one. Okay.
So any question about this? <coughs> okay. So now, <coughs> let's do another arrow diagram. So is this a function? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it an invertible function? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'll say that this is f. What I want you to do is I now want you to draw f inverse, the, the inverse function of f. So again, I want you to have a domain and a range. And what goes where now? Right. So what goes in this one? Four, five, six. And then over here is one, two, three. Okay, so then now what you're doing is you're reading it backwards. Okay, so uh, where does four go? Two. To two. Where does five go? To three. To three. And where does 6 go? Four. To 1. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the name that we're going to give this, just like the, way the, the name that we give to the additive inverse of 5 is negative 5, and the name that we give to the additive inverse of 7 is 1 over 7, the name that we give to the function inverse of f is f, and then you give it superscript negative 1. So that's the name for f inverse. And, and that's pronounced out loud as f inverse. So now what I want you to do is I want you to consider, remember what composition is. It's like a, putting things in order on an assembly line. Okay. So So let's say that this, that this first branch is going to be f, and this one f inverse. So what goes here? One, two, three. One, two, three. Here? Four, five, six. Four, five, six. And what goes here? One, two, three. Okay, now let's draw what happens. So we do f first. Where does f send 1? To 6. to 6. And now we're going to do f inverse. Where does f inverse send 6? To 1. Okay, so where does f send 2? To? to 4. And where does f inverse send 4? <coughs> and where does f send 3? To 5. And where does f inverse send 5? To 3. And so now what I want you to observe about this machine. Where, if, if you ignore the inside, if you ignore the inside, where does 1 go? To 1. Where does 2 go? to 2. Where does 3 go? Three. To 3. This is a machine that takes its input and does nothing with it. It says, this is, this, is, this is a conveyor belt on an assembly line. It does nothing with it. So this is an identity function. You give it 1, it gives you 1. You give it 2, it gives you 2. You give it 3, it gives you 3. So composing functions in this order, what function did we get when we did that? We got the identity function. 
That's why this is the inverse function of that one. Because when you compose them, you get the identity. It's just like, <coughs> why, why is negative 4 the additive, identity, the, the additive inverse of 4? Because when you add them, you get 0. Why is 3 halves the multiplicative inverse of 2 thirds? Because when you multiply them, you get 1, which is the multiplicative identity. Why is this function the functional inverse of that function? Because when you compose them, you get the identity function. That's why. And so now the question, the, the next question we need to address, we just barely are going to have time to even talk about it, is supposing I give you a plot now, not an arrow diagram, but supposing that I give you a plot, how do you compute the inverse? So the, the key idea The key idea is that you're going to swap inputs and outputs. Now, if we stick with the, with the convention, uh, the lettering convention that we always use, that is to say, what, what is almost always the letter that we use for inputs? X, and what is almost always the letter that we use for outputs? Y. So that is to say, we're going to switch X's and Y's. We're going to switch X's and Y's. And what that means, if we had a point 3, 5 that was, that was on the original function, then what point is on the inverse function? 5, 3. And so, when you take coordinates and you switch them like that, the name for that is called transposition. So that is, uh, that word is used a lot, transposition. Uh, for example, in spelling, that's the, one of the most common spelling and typing errors is transposition of letters. Right, so then what's the, what is the, what is the inverse point of 1, 2? Two? 2, 1. What's the inverse point of 7, 7? Seven? 7, 7, right? So some points are their own inverse. Just like 0 is its own additive inverse, mm -hmm. 1 is its own multiplicative inverse, 10, 10 is its own point inverse. Okay, so we'll talk more about that on Friday. Have a nice day.